after spending six years in the legislature and eight years as Secretary of State, right now at the point I'm at in my life, I have no interest in politics and really don't believe that it's where I can make the most difference in the world or really anybody can make the most difference in the world. You know, when I was first going out to campaigning, this is more than 16 years ago, I believe, so one of the things I did was collect it up who was the regular voters in the Republican primary? And I set as a goal to meet every single one of those people. One of those people, it was very strange, one of those people had voted in three of the last four, because I was working on four, four, three of the last four, but had not voted in the last primary. I was driving out Skylight Mountain Road and I missed the little gravel road turn off to get back off up to where his place was at several times. Spinning wheels on gravel to get my little car up to the top of this hill. As I come around the curve and I'm going up to the top of the hill, I'm noticing there's no power lines. And suddenly I come up on this house. So I knock on the door and it sounds hollow inside. I'm thinking nobody lives here anymore, right? And out of the corner of my eye, I catch emotion. I look over there and there's a guy standing there with a shotgun. He's about the age I am now, but he seemed old to me at the time. I was only 34 years old and he was mid-50s. And he says, you look like a fine young man, but the Babylonian system cannot be reformed from within. Now get off my porch. I got off his porch. <laughs> But you know, one of the things about that is, is even though I talk to thousands of people, the one conversation that I can remember and I thought about a lot over the years was that statement. I began to tell that story because it was kind of kooky and something I laughed at. I thought he's just mm, crazy, right? But as crazy as it was, I got to thinking more and more, especially my, as my experience went on, more and more what it meant and what it come to mean and whether it was true. I've come to the conclusion that the statement is probably has a lot of truth in it. The system can't be reformed from inside. It has to be reformed from the outside. The only way to access the levers to reform a society is through the hearts and minds of individuals. I got interested in ballot access laws when I was in college in the middle 60s, and I've never stopped being interested in it. I've been a lawyer now for almost 43 years, and I practice various different types of law, but I think one of my specialties is in the area of ballot access and constitutional law as to elections. When I was in college, I was fascinated by minor party activists I thought, well, how come they're in the ballot in some states and not others? Because I was into the, looking at election returns. I loved election returns. And that's when I found out about the ballot access laws, because it turns out every state writes its own ballot access laws. Some of them were fair and tolerant, and some of them weren't. So that's what deflected me into looking at the ballot access laws. And that's, I never stopped being fascinated by them. There is no one to replace Richard Winger. He is a unique individual. He has more knowledge about minor parties, independent candidates, ballot access, election law history than anybody else in the world. In uh, 1889, the first state in the United States printed up a government printed ballot. And once there's a government printed ballot, that's the only ballot that's legal. Before then, there were no government ballots. Every voter was free to make his or her, and it was mostly him, of course, ballot. You could take a piece of paper and write down who you wanted to vote for and put it in the ballot box. So there was no way the government could stop anybody from voting for anybody they wanted. So we had a perfectly free system. There was no such thing as a filing fee or a petition to get on the ballot or a declaration of candidacy to get on the ballot. Most states let any party in the ballot if it just asked and held a nominating convention. But over the years, more and more states 
started abusing their power and started making rules that make it very hard for new parties or little parties to get on the ballot and independent candidates. Mr. Winger, welcome to the committee. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate um, having a chance to express some of the concerns of parties other than the Democratic and Republican parties. Back in 1985, I started Ballot Access News. That's my monthly print newsletter. So it's 35 years old now. The ballot access laws are constantly changing. Every odd year, half the states have bills in their legislature to change the ballot access laws. Every year, there are about 20 lawsuits filed over the ballot access laws. So there's, a, there's a lot to cover. And the reason I started it, a bill was introduced in Congress to outlaw restrictive ballot access laws. And I was fanatically in favor of this bill. Or alternatively, if you incorporated parts of Congressman Conyers' H.R. 2320 into this bill, that would solve the problem in another way. I was afraid most people didn't know about it. So I started the newsletter. I sent it out free to everybody who I thought would be interested in this bill. I'm just interested in that. So it passed? Oh, no. <laughs> if it had passed, we would have solved the problem. This ballot access bill was introduced into Congress, nine sessions of Congress. First, Congressman John Conyers of Michigan introduced it three times. And then Congressman Tim Penny of Minnesota introduced it twice. And then four times, Congressman Ron Paul of Texas introduced it. But it never passed. The third time, we got up to 40 co-sponsors. There's 435 members of the U.S. House, so even 40 co-sponsors isn't all that wonderful. And then in 1998, Congressman Ron Paul pulled a parliamentary maneuver. It is now in order to consider the amendment by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Paul. As an amendment to another election law bill. My amendment is very simple. It's an amendment that deals with equity and fairness, so I would expect uh, essentially no opposition to this. And he got in his bill a vote on the U.S. House floor. It simply lowers and standardizes the signature requirements and the time required to get signatures to get a federal uh, candidate on the ballot. There are very many unfair rules and regulations by the states that makes it virtually impossible for many candidates to get on the ballot. That's the only time the full House ever voted on it. All time having expired. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Paul. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Texas. I, I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to House Resolution 442, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas will be postponed. But only 63 members of the House voted for it. My first ballot access case was in the year 1980, so it's been almost 40 years now, and involved a law in Oklahoma where I had a candidate um, who was a client of mine. She had filed as a state senate candidate for a newly recognized minor party and had been kicked off the ballot. The incumbent senator had objected to her because she hadn't been a member of the new party for six months, which she couldn't do because the party had only been recognized for a month. And that's how I met Richard Winger, because he heard about my case that I'd wanted. And after that, uh, we became friends and we worked on quite a number of cases. I got active trying to change the ballot access laws in 1965 when I was still a college undergraduate. I went to my hometown state legislator and asked him to introduce a bill to make it easier for minor parties to get in the ballot in California. It took them two years to vote on that bill. So my bill got introduced and it passed the election law committees in both houses, but it lost on the floor of both houses. Then, in 1970, I found out the Socialist Workers Party was gonna sue California over the ballot access laws, and I wanted to help with that lawsuit. The first time I ever filed any evidence outside California happens to have been in Arkansas. 
The American Party was filed a lawsuit against the new 3% petition, and I, I gave an affidavit in that. Arkansas is very unique in that it has continually, for 45, 50 years, have a whole series of cases where ballot access laws have been declared unconstitutional. And then the legislature corrects the law. And then over a period of time, after the new law was placed, that replaced the unconstitutional law, then the legislature, as though nothing had been done, passes a new law, which is also unconstitutional. And they've gotten slapped down over and over again. I guess I got started in politics. I was interested in it, you know, like a lot of people early on, but I really only got into it in my mid-30s because it, it only occurred to me then, someone told me, well, gee, the way you influence politics is that you join one of the two parties. You join the Republican Party or you join the Democrat Party. I marched down to my local county committee meeting, Republican County Committee meeting, and Union County, Arkansas, and it just so happened that they were having a big, ugly fight with one another. I was the new guy, and so the two sides didn't trust each other, they kind of trusted me. And I wound up like vice chairman of the Union County Republican Committee, my second or third meeting or something like that. And so I really tried to influence things that way. I participated in the party system. And, but I also got my, my eyes open. I remember there was this one meeting and it was about picking candidates for the next election cycle. I was there by accident. The chairman, he couldn't make it that day. So he said, look, would you show up to this meeting where these guys are gonna help recruit and draft candidates to run as Republicans for our county and our area? And I thought that was really kind of odd because I thought that's what the county county committee did. I thought they were supposed to recruit candidates and help candidates, but when I, when I get in the room, and it, the room was held at the top of this building owned by a very wealthy man who was a big time Republican donor, and I, again, I was kind of there by accident because I was just the vice chairman, and the, and the, but I was the only county committee member in the room, and I thought that was very odd. There was the state executive director for the Republican Party, he was in the room, this rich guy was in the room, uh, the campaign chairman, the guy who ran the campaign for our local state representative, he was in the room. The odd thing was, the state representative was a Democrat. And so you had the campaign chairman of the Democrat state representative in the room of this secret group of big hitters who didn't bother going to local county committee meetings, and they were there to, to pick everybody's choices. People think that these party candidates can serve their constituents and their party. And the party just wanted business. They, they would rather the other party win than a guy who wasn't gonna play ball for the team. And the team wasn't their constituents, the team was the party. A friend once told me, a friend who found himself an insider for a while by accident, he said in order to be an insider, when the chips are down, you've got to be willing to do the wrong thing for the right people. And that's what it is to be an insider. And they could not trust Mark Martin to do that. Now, one of the things about being in the system and being in the system of government that is kind of interesting, and I told you, we talked about going with the flow. Well, the flow was really being driven by where the real access to power is at and the money that influences what the flow is. But most people are not aware of that. So much so that one particular senator who is now incarcerated in federal penitentiary said, the only problem with Mark Martin is, is he can never just go with the flow. But I was a plumber long enough to know exactly where the flow goes. At one point, 10% of our Senate, including the governor's nephew, was under indictment for something. And I don't think they caught them all. I thought 
let's get another party. Well, I looked at the law. The law said you needed 3%, and this is like in 2004, 3% of the people who voted for governor or president in the last election to get a new party on the ballot. That's a lot of signatures to get in two or three months. But there was a court ruling that said in a footnote, guys, we're looking at Arkansas's election law. Yes, we're ruling the law that we've been asked to look at as unconstitutional. But this other thing, this limit of 3% of the signatures needed to get a new party on the ballot, that would also be unconstitutional. If we were being asked to rule on that, we'd say that was unconstitutional too. In looking at this, there is a big difference from one state to another. Some states let candidates on the ballot simply by filing or by signatures, sometimes as low as 25 signatures or 100 or 500. And in other states, you have signature requirements up to 5% or so. Generally, in the last 30 or 40 years, no petition signature requirement above 5% has held to be constitutional. But then the question is, how do you collect those signatures? How many, can you collect them in 30 days, 90 days, six months, a year? Then there's the deadline. And this is particularly important. Uh, a lot of times, you don't know if you want to support or be an independent candidate or a third party candidate until you find out what the major parties are going to do. But if you have a deadline a year before the election, you don't know that. And generally, deadlines that are more than a year before the election have been held to be unconstitutional. And then, of course, finally, you look to whether or not the requirements have ever been complied with. It's one thing, as the U.S. Supreme Court has said, if uh, candidates and their supporters have regularly achieve ballot access as opposed to they rarely or ever have achieved ballot access. I found a maverick state legislator, Jim Holt, and I said, Jim, look at this court ruling. The courts are going to look at this president and they're going to say, you're right, the law needs to be changed and Arkansas needs to pay the attorney's fees for the folks that sued you. He sponsored the bill. So when I went to run the bill, I'd actually filed it, and it wasn't any time before I started kind of getting the cold shoulder, and I got a call in from one of my fellow senators, who was also, I believe at the time, the, the state party chairman of the Republican Party, Gilbert Baker. I thought, well, this is like a, a no-brainer. We're going to comply with the courts. I don't see what the problem is. And Gilbert says, well, you realize this like hurts our party. And I said, well, how does this hurt the party? If anything, it'll help us. I thought Republicans were supposed to be about competition. He just kind of shook his head. like He's like, well, we're, this is not going to go anywhere. Uh, we're not going to be able to do anything. He goes, I, I'm going to have to fight you on this. And he goes, and the Democrats will fight you on this too because this makes more competition against us and we kind of like the way things are. Nobody wanted to listen to what he had to say. I couldn't get a motion. There, there was no motion. I mean, it was like, it was just dead silence. I'm not sure if it was that senator, but he just kind of got up and went to get a coffee, and a few of them just got and walked out. Just, they didn't want anything to do with it. And of course, you know, the, uh, I don't remember the newspaper even writing anything about it being a good law either. Nobody want, cared what the court precedent was. All they cared about was protecting their privileged status. And that bill, it didn't even get a second. It died in committee and did not get a second. When we were in office, behind closed doors, the Democrats and the Republicans would get together, I like you, hey, I like you. You know, as long as we can keep our incumbent we're happy. That's what they would call you when you get elected and you played the game, they called you an incumbent I've been a witness for many different minor parties, and when one minor party wins a constitutional ballot access case, obviously all minor parties benefit. So it doesn't really matter who the plaintiff is. 
See, I forget. <laughs> what else was I going to say? Was there anything else about this? So one of the problems we have right now in our any kind of political discourse is that we have these labels that really divide us. And they're so, in some ways, meaningless. People are complex. I've met conservatives, I've met liberals, I've met Republicans, Democrats. Often there's some really common values that we all share, stuff that we all want. But when the media especially begins to say, this is Democrat versus Republican, liberal versus conservative, it starts to divide us much more than we realize. And that in itself is a huge problem. A great example of a country that has a multi-party system is New Zealand. They have right now five different political parties in power, in, in the parliament. With a multi-party system, we begin to have to work together because all of us have some level of uh, leverage to be able to, if you don't have a coalition, then you're not gonna be in power. So that means we have to cooperate somehow. Fancy that idea. Oh, the reasoning is, well, it depends on whether they're talking honestly or dishonestly. The two leading nationally organized minor parties in this country are the Libertarian Party and the Green Party. And those happen to have been the, except for the Reform Party, those are the only parties that have managed to get on the ballot in Arkansas. If you want an example of an honest comment, I was at a Georgia state legislative hearing once and a legislator on the elections committee said, I don't want no damn libertarian running against me, <laughs> which I appreciated. The Libertarian Party was formed in 1972 and it has elected state legislators in this country in Alaska, New Hampshire, and Vermont. For that, the only elected libertarian public official in the United States yet is Dick Randolph, and he is here with us this morning. There's Green Parties all over the world, and the Green Party in other nations has been very successful in getting into government. Austrian conservative leader Sebastian Kurz has struck a coalition deal, this time with the Greens, and brings the left-wing Greens into government for the first time. And yet, in this country, the, the highest office the Green Party has ever been able to win is just state legislature. They've never come close to winning a congressional seat. I have moved to Arkansas about a, a decade ago, in 2009, and uh, so I've been involved in Arkansas Libertarian Party politics uh, for the past decade, really throughout the period in which we've uh, had candidates on the ballot. We first attained ballot access in uh, 2012, and uh, then I've been a part of the ballot access team uh, really ever since. Kind of a long story in the evolution of what it takes to get a third party on the ballot. Before 1971, it was just a matter of calling yourself a political party, having a convention, and notifying the Secretary of State. Uh, then they established uh, petition signature requirements. At first it was 7% and then 3%. And all throughout the 70s and 80s, uh, and 90s for that matter, uh, there was no third party that was able to make that, uh, that cut. There were a couple of lawsuits, one in 1996 and another in 2006, that challenged these laws as being overly restrictive. Uh, and in both cases, uh, the federal courts found in favor of the third parties. In the first case, it was the Reform Party, and then in 2006, it was the, the Green Party. And so then it was uh, subsequent to that 2006 lawsuit that uh, the legislature passed the 10,000 signature requirement, and that would align it uh, with the number of signatures required for a statewide independent candidate. There were a couple of elections where there were actually four parties on the ballot, uh, the two big parties and uh, the Greens and the Libertarians. Uh, in the last couple of electoral cycles, the 
Libertarian Party has been the only uh, alternative party that has been able to make the ballot. And uh, so I, I guess all that is by way of saying that the, the argument that the ballot is overcrowded and we have to limit access to the, the two major parties really doesn't uh, carry any weight at all. It just, uh, there, there's never been a, a period of time in Arkansas's history when their ballot's been overcrowded, uh, not by any means. Tell us who you are and what role you played in the Green Party in Arkansas. I'm Rebecca Kennedy, and for a lot of years I was on the executive committee of the Green Party of Arkansas, and I ran for a lot of offices, probably my most high-profile race, definitely my most high-profile race. I ran for U.S. Senate against Mark Pryor, who was the only establishment party candidate in the race. He was a Democratic candidate, at least nominally, but the Republican Party didn't run a candidate against him. And I ran against Pryor primarily because I didn't have anybody to vote for. That seems like it should be unprecedented, but it's not. A first-year incumbent having an unopposed race for a coveted major political office in the United States. We're not talking about someone running unopposed for county clerk. In fact, uh, in Arkansas elections, sometimes the majority of candidates on the ballot are unopposed. Obviously, and I think the people of the state, along with the legislature and the government, have a compelling state interest to make sure they have fair and honest and open elections. But it has to be more than words. You have to show something. So if you're fighting an overcrowded ballot, well, show me that the ballot was overcrowded. Arkansas. Um, in the last several legislative elections, uh, even with the libertarians being recognized, uh, 40 or 50 percent of the legislative seats have no candidates running other than the incumbent. There's no election. So you can't, Arkansas is not troubled by an overcrowded ballot. You would think that there'd be competition for something like that, but there's not. And that's because the competing has already happened behind closed doors. And that's what was happening with Mark Pryor. He had been anointed U.S. Senator. He didn't think he needed to be elected. And I thought he needed to be elected. And I also thought that I needed someone to vote for in that election. And what I discovered was I wasn't going to have anyone to vote for in that election if I didn't do two things. If I didn't lead a ballot drive, lead a petition drive to make sure there was a spot on the ballot for somebody to run. And then even among the people who were willing to help with that, I wasn't going to have a candidate to vote for if I didn't step forward and actually run myself. You know, I'm not privy to everything that the Attorney General sees when they make the decisions on what to do in that case. So it's easy to second guess another lawyer for their litigation decisions when you're not looking at what they're looking at. I was one of only two candidates, by definition one of the top two contenders in a supposedly democratically elected race for the United States Senate. In other words, I was one of two people contending. The purpose of this election supposedly is to allow millions of Arkansans to select between these two candidates. I was, other than Fayetteville Public Access, I believe I was on um, television twice before the AETN debate, your typical commercial network television station. I was, I, I was interviewed for the news once and I was either, I think, spoken to at an event once, so, I mean, the total, total television time, including public access, was probably five or six television appearances in a race that went on for more than a year. We would put out a press release and there might not be any response whatsoever. We would call a press conference and there might be one camera there and there might not. And so when you're talking about the voters in a democracy having to choose between two candidates, it's one thing to say, well, you can spend as much money as you want advertising and maybe one person has a slicker campaign and their advertising message out there, but it's another thing to say, 
and the media is going to treat it like only one of these campaigns is doing anything that's important or newsworthy. How is the voter supposed to choose between candidates in a race on the basis of anything other than establishment connections and money when the voter will not see a candidate who does not have establishment connections and money? What I figured, ultimately, looking back on my career with the Green Party and the races that I ran, I found as a more mature person with a family, I, I still believe it. It's important to run. It's important to fight. We win victories by fighting. But I can't justify spending every evening not home with my son because I have to be fighting to win or run in or make points in an election so that there will be somebody for me and people who think like I do to vote for in the election. I can't stop living my life and do that instead. And that's what you have to do to make an impact because I can't quit my job. They wear you out. They wear people out. Generation after generation after generation of passionate, young, politically active people have been worn out by this process. There was a, there was a time there where I thought, well, we just need another party. And I still believe that. I, I, it would be better to me if we had 10 parties than if we had two. I mean, it's just like George Washington said, his greatest fear was America divided into two great camps. And they'd be divided by partisanship and, and not principle. So he was very prescient. So I, I did, I tried to help with a minor party and, until I figured out, well, I don't want them running the country either. I became an independent, as someone who believed that there should be independence in the legislature. The grassroots groups were frustrated. The grassroots groups were experiencing what I experienced during my brief time in the Republican Party. I went to one of these groups, more than one. These poor souls, they had gone and they had knocked on doors. They'd gone around, put up signs, taken down signs. Some of them had donated money from their family budget that they don't really have to elect these politicians. And then as soon as the politician would get in, he would start listening to the party bosses and not the people that got him there. And these grassroots people were hacked off, and they should have been. I said, guys, why do you need them? You can get these signatures. If you just get enough signatures, it takes four or 500 for a state rep and maybe eight or 900 for a state senate seat. Go get the signatures and run people as independents. A bunch of them said, yeah, okay, we're gonna do that. We're gonna go down to the state capitol we are going to file for the state legislature. And so I did, I was one of the ones, and it was like the last full day that you could file. I went down and filed. And of course, there was no Democrat in the race. It was a Republican, it was a super heavy Republican district. And it was, it was me as an independent and the Republican. We had about two months to get we needed really 450 signatures, but to, to make sure that we had enough that would actually count, we were shooting for 550. We spent a lot of time on the Secretary of State's website trying to verify the signatures too. That took a lot of time. Oh, well, we met in politics. We were both volunteering on a campaign, actually. My brother was volunteering and brought me in on it, and that's how we met. And then when we got married, we spent the first few months of our marriage campaigning also and just never really stopped. It seems like when I was going door to door for Mark's campaign, when he was running as an independent, I got to meet so many people of Pea Ridge and they were so nice. It was really a great experience to be involved on that level. I remember having to help people round up their pets that escaped when they came out to sign. 
Um, one lady came to the door in a towel. She was very nice, tried to give me a rose. Um, I remember the final day we were collecting signatures. We were waiting on several people to bring some that they had collected to make sure we had enough. And we were basically celebrating all the way down to Little Rock that we finally had enough signatures. I had the signatures and a friend of mine drove them down to Little Rock and said, here are Mark Moore's signatures, put him on the ballot. And I remember celebrating afterwards at um, Mexico Chiquita, I think it was, and it was uh, very optimistic. As it was, I got 38.5% of the vote. And one of the seven people who made the ballot from this group of independents did a little better than I did. So we thought, you know what, we're going to come back in 2014 and we'll do it in a bigger way. What I remember was the more we, that we tried to be involved in politics, the harder it was getting and the more frustrated we were getting. And we were moving from place to place short term, but still very much based in Arkansas, our families in Arkansas. I had most of my babies in Arkansas and it was getting more and more difficult to participate in the system, not from being out of town from time to time, but from the changes they were making legally. When I decided to pick up politics again and look at the issue and said, okay, let's go recruit some independents to run. And they say, it's already too late. You should have already been collecting signatures. And I look and they had changed the law on us. Between 2012 election and 2014 election, during 2013, they had changed that law to where you couldn't do that anymore. You couldn't do what I did in 2012. The way they changed the law, we would have had to bring all of those signatures already collected with us at the time he filed. They changed the law to where you couldn't decide to see how things are shaking up. You should have heard the guy that sponsored the bill to begin with, we had a newspaper interview and he all but admitted that he did it to give the party candidates an idea of what they'd be facing. What was really grating about this was this has already been ruled unconstitutional. They had done this before. They are not what I would call mega mind original thinkers. I would have had to have gone out in the months of December, January, and February and knock on those doors. And of course, no one wants to open the door and talk to you in the middle of Northwest Arkansas in January and February. In December, they're not even there. They're, it, it's Christmas holidays. And if that didn't work, I think they would made, have made it even harder. But it did work. The number of independents dropped to almost zero. I think there was maybe one guy that filed for the legislature as an independent the following term. So I should say something about a man named Jim Lindell. There's a hero in Arkansas called Jim Lendl. He's the one who filed the first lawsuits against the severe independent candidate deadlines and the number of signatures. He was a plaintiff, and uh, I think some one case he even did himself, and then sometimes I think he had legal counsel, and he was generally very successful. He won the case in 1974, the case in 1977, he actually got elected to the legislature as an independent. You know, he put it to use. Then later he joined the Green Party. He was its candidate for governor. And when the Green Party had to sue, he was part of that case. So <laughs> he's been working on this for, well, it's been 50 years almost. Uh. And I don't know what ever happened to him. I don't know if he's still around, but I, I remember reading those decisions and uh, they were very significant. And you might say he was sort of the pioneer in challenging these laws. Is that true? It says that uh, he's gone deaf and he's a social recluse living in Maumelle, Arkansas. Well, he, he must be fairly old now too, so. Yeah. Yeah. If he hadn't done that, if he hadn't got those precedents down, that would have been it. And, and nobody at the time, you know, at the time, I remember seeing a picture of him in the paper and I'm like, that guy is a state legislator? But now here I am and I'm like, that guy was a hero. He, he did that. He took on the system 
long before guys like me ever realized it needed to be taken on, and he won three times. A casualty of this thing for me was my narrow ideas about who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. So there's like who agrees with me on the issues and who doesn't agree with me on the issues, and then there's who agrees with me on the process having integrity. Some of the guys that I think would be my dearest friends that I would agree with totally on what policy ought to be, I disagree with them totally on the integrity of the process. How is it like when you, you, you get so close, you're getting more support every gubernatorial cycle, and then just when you get close to being on a level playing field, they change the rules on you? Well, you know, in the four times that we've had ballot access, two of those uh, have been gubernatorial years and two of them presidential years, every year we've achieved a higher percentage. In 2014, when I decided to run for governor as a libertarian, I did so not in the expectation of ever being the governor of the state, but in the hopes that we would get 3% of the vote in that election. If we got 3%, then the libertarians would become a political party and would have the right to run candidates without having to go through the lengthy and expensive and troublesome process of getting petitions, 10,000 or more signatures on petitions, just to run for office. Well, you know, the hoops that they set up for third parties really put us at a disadvantage relative to the, the two established parties. As it stands right now, at the end of an electoral cycle, we, we go into, uh, uh, after the election, uh, mid-November, late November, we have to already start thinking about how we're going to get on the ballot again in, in the next election. Uh, and that usually requires uh, a couple of months at least of planning. We need to raise the money uh, to run the campaign. Uh, then it's a, a combination of uh, paid petitioners and volunteers out collecting the signatures. And it really eats up about the first uh, six months of the two-year electoral cycle. Do you think that a lot of candidates running in third parties and as independents like, really do need to have a business help them out to get on the ballot? Like, is it that difficult? Yep. You're talking about 10,000 signatures in 90 days. It's tough. It's tough. And I, I want everybody to be on the ballot. You know, I, I mean, it, it, sh it shouldn't be so hard. It really shouldn't be so hard. You know, as it is right now, like I said, 10,000 signatures in 90 days. There's, I don't think there's ever been any volunteer organization that's done that. Not that I know of. Of course, we didn't get the 3% in my campaign, but we laid the groundwork, did some organizational things, and four years later, when Mark West ran as the Libertarian candidate for governor, I think he scared the Democrats and Republicans because he got 2.91% of the vote. 2.9% of the vote, very close. Uh, uh, just heartbreakingly close. I ran for governor in 2018 on libertarian ticket. Uh, we were trying to get 3% in the governor's race uh, for ballot access. 2016 was the first election campaign that I was a part of, and I ran a U.S. House race uh, for Arkansas District 1 against Congressman Rick Crawford, and got 23% in that race and did very well, but did a lot of the retail politics, door to door, going out to do town halls, meet people, that type of politics. And I had decided for 2018 I was going to do more of a local campaign. There was actually a local seat that had opened up because someone had retired and I was looking at uh, going for that seat. And the weekend that I was trying to make my mind up, a local guy had jumped in who was very popular locally. He was a, he was a, he'd been a lifelong Democrat, but he was going to run as a Republican. You know how that works. <laughs> um, they thought that I would be a good candidate to, or a good fit, um, because I'd performed very well in my debate. Uh, that I would be a good fit to run for governor and be able to make a shot at the three uh, percent. We spent about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars a year um, just trying to get ballot access. The signatures paid petitioners or canvassers to go out and get signatures so that we could get ballot access. Plus all the legal fights that we have seem to have every campaign season. I, I agreed with those in the party that were trying to get me to do that and decided to go ahead and take on the bigger race 
and run the race and, and that was our goal uh, from day one. We've said it several times at the convention, we want 3%. This is the race uh, for 3% and that is what we thought we were going to get. That's what we shot for. That's what we campaigned for, the way we organized events, the way we organized everything. It was all geared toward hitting the right areas and finding the way to get that 3% uh, on election day. Yeah, election night was, it was rough. Uh, we had a, a watch party scheduled in downtown Little Rock and we were there watching the returns come back and of course I had the laptop out because I, I knew what I needed to be uh, percentage-wise in different counties and different areas in order for us to be getting close to 3% and everything we were watching we were just, we were going to be short. I mean we could tell we were going to be short. Uh, so we watched as they kind of dribbled in and uh, and I just remember leaving my own watch party early because I knew it was not going to finish where we wanted to. I just, you could just see from the numbers we were going to be just short, just weren't sure how much. So I went home and I sat in the dark on my couch all night and just watched. <laughs> and we missed it by 860 votes, if I remember the number correctly. I mean, so close, uh, you know, with all the tens, hundreds of thousands of votes out there, we missed it by 860 votes. That night was a long and deflating night uh, because we had worked so hard. Uh, and then I felt personally responsible for letting the whole party down. You know, I really felt like I let everybody down because uh, we were polling at 5% going in and, and we missed it by 0.09%. And uh, uh, for me, it, it led to a depression. Um, I'm now clinically diagnosed with depression, uh, so I've stepped away from the whole political realm. It's it's completely driven me out because I've got to get my mental health right because I do have a wife, children, family, and a job that that I've got to keep doing, and and those things have to come first. So we had really put a lot of stock in that campaign, thinking that this was a candidate who could get us our 3%. He uh, really worked hard, campaigned hard, uh, gathered a great following, was doing fundraising, doing all the things that uh, uh, really should guarantee success, at least to the level that we're trying to achieve it at this point. At the time, we thought, well, we're going to have to get another 10,000 signatures. Um, as it turns out, uh, there were even more obstacles in our way than that. It was pretty obvious that one more election and we would have a good chance of punching through the 3% and becoming a real voice in Arkansas politics. So the next session of the legislature did what thieves and crooks always do, they changed the rules. Out of the blue, in February of 2019, the legislature uh, considers a bill that raises the threshold to 3% of the vote. They had been forced by the federal courts to go to 10,000 signatures as sufficient to put a new party on the ballot. And in spite of uh, judicial precedents that they knew applied, they changed the law back to 3%, which was the figure that had been struck down by the federal courts just years before. In essence, what they had done was reinstitute the old law that had already been declared unconstitutional, not only once, but twice, in 96 and 2006. And the thing is, it seems that no one in the legislature had any institutional memory or even wanted to tap into that memory to realize that it had already been declared unconstitutional, not just once, but twice. You, you know, it's like, it reminds me about some children, you know, you tell them you shouldn't do something and they like, okay, well, and then they go out and do it again and they just want to see what they can get away with. Now, whether that's because they're actually trying to get away with something or the institutional memory of the legislature is not good and they forget about this because most legislatures are members of the major parties and they're not really concerned about the interest of independents or minor party candidates. So sometimes it's not that they're trying to be unfair, it's just that they don't consider the interest of other individuals who aren't just like them, members of the major parties. In my efforts to lobby against SB 163, I brought court cases for the committee. What I would do is I'd wait outside the House of Representatives and you send in notes to leg specific legislators you'd like to speak, and then they'll come out and you can talk with them. I reached about, I'd say, 
two-thirds of the legislators. Uh, we went through efforts to uh, uh, testify before the, uh, both the House and Senate uh, committees that were considering the legislation. Uh, we organized a letter writing campaign. I personally contacted uh, all the senators that uh, uh, were on the committee uh, voting on this. Part of my uh, lobbying of the uh, senators and the representatives in speaking to the committees was to tell them the history of this legislation and of the litigation around it, uh, and just to let them know that this has already been declared unconstitutional. The senator running the bill, uh, his name's uh, Trent Gardner, he came with three court cases and claimed that those court cases superseded the court case we had been using. He was able to ram the bill through with that. They duly passed the bill, the governor signed it into law, and uh, uh, we filed a lawsuit in federal court. In a way, it makes you think that uh, perhaps their motive wasn't truly to keep us off the ballot, but uh, to force us to use a lot of our resources just to campaign not only to get back on the ballot, uh, but to do so through the court system. So we, uh, we had to hire an attorney, build our case, spend hours preparing and uh, going to the hearings. Uh, so that added, like I said, another layer of complexity to the whole process. What I had to do was go down and file for an office. I went down and I filed to run for lieutenant governor and they said to me, you don't have the signatures. Now the law has changed, you've got to collect the signatures first. When you come and file, you've got to have the signatures. And I said, well, that's what this lawsuit's going to be about. There was a rather early deadline and the deadline was basically you'd be collecting signatures to be an independent candidate before you even knew who the Republicans and Democrats were going to run, and which is contrary to numerous court decisions that say you should allow independent and third-party candidates to make decisions after the Republicans and Democrats have chosen their nominee. And I thought that would you know, to me, I thought the law in Arkansas was clearly unconstitutional and that the matter could be settled by summary judgment. And of course, my attorney at first thought they would see how one-sided the precedent was and uh, just throw in the towel. No, you know, you don't know them like I know them. They will fight to the last taxpayer dollar. Now, it was the legislature that passed the law. It was them that I really had to beef with. But the way the system works, since the Secretary of State enforces the election law, he was the one who had to be sued. And I thought I was suing the office and not the man as a private citizen who was acting in the office. And the man was a friend of mine. Uh, Mark Martin is his name. In my role as Secretary of State, I was sued for certain laws that were on the books. So I was accustomed to being sued, even by friends, even by friends that were wanting to change things the way I wanted them to do. But my obligation was not to bring about what my desires for the law was, but to uphold the law. I have a trusted deputy who was my chief legal counsel, A.J. Kelly. I just handed that Mark Moore's lawsuit to A.J. and said, do it by the book. That was very much my regular response to stuff that came in, was dot the I's, cross the T's, and do it by the book. When I called him and said what I was doing, it started as a joke. Uh, but over as the years went by, I guess it kind of morphed into something else, much to my regret. When Mark come and was asking me about that and making sure that the friendship had continued, to me, I had to think hard about what the details of the case was. That's just how much it did not impact my life because so much more stuff, the weight of the office itself, that was a very insignificant part of the weight of the office. I got the feeling he was loath to do this. He didn't really want to even fight with me either. But he had his deputy, Mr. Kelly, and Mr. Kelly 
was very aggressive about it. I've, I've done lots of cases in probably a dozen states or more, and Arkansas is the only state where I did not deal with the Attorney General's office. That was unique that uh, Arkansas had their own counsel. Of course, the Secretary of State in Arkansas is elected by the people in a partisan race, and the Attorney General is elected by the people in a partisan race. And I think at times in Arkansas, there was times when the Secretary of State and the Attorney General were of different political parties, and maybe that was where that happened. I don't know when it happened. I just know that I saw like 20 or 25 years ago, Arkansas's election laws, the uh, challenges, they had the Attorney General, and then by the time I got over there, all of a sudden they had their own counsel. Uh, for the, the, the Attorney General didn't have anything to do with it, and then just recently, this latest case I had, all of a sudden the Attorney General has taken over and they're doing everything. The strategy of Mr. Kelly was, you just throw everything against the wall and hope something sticks. You accuse everything you can think of, you put it in there. And it was 120 pages long, his defense. One thing they really focused on, and they, they do this with a lot of activists, not just me, it's the principle of standing. If I wanted to, as a resident of Oklahoma, I wanted to file an action challenging the election rules for voters in Alaska. And they'd say, well, Mr. Linger, how do you have standing? Because it has to somehow impact you. And the judge said, no, he has standing. He has standing as a voter and as a candidate. It's recognized that candidates have a right uh, to try to be candidates, but that's not what is most important. The courts first consider the right of voters to free expression, First Amendment rights, equal protection, to cast their vote effectively. And that can't be done if the candidate you favor can be kept off the ballot. One of the, one of the more ridiculous things that was in this 120 pages was, well, before we could count the signatures, but due to changes in the election law, we just can't count independent signatures anymore, so we've got to move them way up. They didn't have any evidence to support that contention, they just made the claim. They had an affidavit. They had this guy do this affidavit. He wasn't there to cross-examine, obviously, that said, oh gee, due to changes in the election law, we had to move the independent signature period up, we just can't do it anymore. I mean, it just, it totally wasn't true. We later, we did the calendar, and it actually, was easier for them to count the signatures. They had less going on. My lawyer didn't think much of that claim. That seemed to me patently wrong, but they actually had people swear they couldn't get them counted in time. And as a result, the court denied our motion for summary judgment and granted the uh, Secretary of State's motion for summary judgment. This fellow was a rookie federal judge. His father was a longtime federal judge, and now he was a federal judge, Judge Moody. He's an establishment guy. He wants to give the state the benefit of a doubt. He, he would surely think that the state wouldn't just file an affidavit and there'd be absolutely nothing to it. There was a, you can't have a summary judgment based on an assertion. And we never got a chance to cross-examine any witnesses. We never got a chance to, and they never showed that their assertion was true. So we appealed to the Eighth Circuit. Two of the judges were very skeptical of what the state had said, but they wanted to give the state a chance to prove that they really need that much time. They uh, said the judge was right in denying our motion for summary judgment, but he was also wrong in granting the Secretary of State's motion for summary judgment. And the reason was because it was not clear on the record. There seemed to be a factual dispute as to whether they could get the signatures counted. The third judge was even better, and he said, no, this is unconstitutional. The dissent said, it's very clear on the record that, yes, they can count the signatures because the deadline's not anywhere near where it interferes with anything else. And then, in fact, there had been numerous cases where it had been declared unconstitutional in the past on the deadlines. But the other judges said, no, we think there is something of a dispute, and therefore, we send it back for trial. So it was sent back down to the district court, and this time I went. And so the first time the judge had ruled against us, and I, I thought he had learned some things since then, because the legislature wasn't just cheating independents. They changed a bunch of ballot access laws. They made it harder for new parties. They made it harder for everybody. I wanted me there. I wanted my wife there. I wanted my daughter there. 
to be able to look at him and see that this just isn't some academic point of law that we're discussing. You know, there's, there's real people that have gone to real trouble to put you in the position to make a ruling on this issue. And we want you to make one that's, that's fair to all parties. This was like the very end of 2018 when this happened. We started at the very beginning of 2014. And you've never seen a more one-sided court case. When I was invited to go to Little Rock and watch this, I walk in there and was just absolutely <laughs> baffled by the one-sided, you know, kind of uh, show, whatever you want to call it, S show, really. <laughs> I tell you, it was, it was quite interesting to see the attorney for the state um, basically throw anything he could at the wall. I mean, Mr. Linger showed a lot of decorum, showed a lot of restraint, would be subtle, not try to over-explain it to the judges, let them connect the dots. Meanwhile, to me, the other side, Mr. Kelly, he was just groin kicking, eye gouging. You know, he'd, he'd make every accusation you could make just in the hopes that one of them would stick. It's, uh, some people would call somebody, you know, obnoxious while someone else would say they're well principled. So it's just how you want to subjectively evaluate. I haven't had any, you know, I just, uh, of course, I always tell them sometimes, you know, if they hadn't made all these arguments, I wouldn't have been paid as much that much money. It was his style to be combative and to raise every point and to contest every point. You know, I'm making this sound like it's bad, but I admired his spunk. That was what allowed this case to drag on as long as it did, is that he just fought on everything, and the, out of the 100 things or whatever, the judge found one of them he liked. But by this time, the judge had caught on. We got in the court, we got the witnesses on the stand. Jim Linger was, he was Perry Mason. He was, he was awesome. The state's witness, when he got on the stand, went right down, Mark's attorney went right down, the, just walking him down the path, and the guy in the very end said, yes, there was, there was no reason whatsoever we needed to move the date so that we had time to count signatures or file papers or what. Didn't need to happen what's at all, at all. Their witness said, even if the filing period for the signatures was where it was, we could still get the job done. There was no necessity for the state to move the deadline up. And so even their witness was agreeing to our point. Nothing like the magic of cross-examination. It was a slaughter. The judge really, it was obvious who he needed to rule for. And a couple of weeks later, we got the word. He ruled in our favor. He said Mark Moore has until May 1st to turn in his paperwork to be a candidate for some office. I mean, it was just obvious that there was no interference with the time to count signatures and everything, and the judge declared the law unconstitutional on remand. Of course, they appealed again. One thing in this case that they never let go of, they started with it, and they never stopped, never, was the idea of standing. They were saying that I didn't have the right to ask the question of whether this law was constitutional or not. They, and that's what they mean when they say you don't have standing. And of course, I was uh, offended by that, uh, but they never let go of it. I mean, they, they argued it in the district court. The district court said, nah, he's got standing. He's got standing as a voter and as a candidate. And they argued, still argued in the circuit court. And the circuit court said, nah, he's got standing. He's got standing as a voter and as a candidate. And then they appealed it to the Supreme Court of the United States. And the Supreme Court is like, we're not even going to look at this. And so then it eventually got ordered back to the district court. They were still arguing standing. They, they never let go of it. And, and all during this time, there was just like all kinds of objections and uh, motions and all kinds of things making us do stuff. It stalled as long as possible. So even though I filed like in early 2014 is when I filed, this thing didn't get resolved until pretty much into, well into 2019. So more than five years, more than five years. The state legislature during all this mess, they changed the law back to what it was in 2012. Out of the goodness of their heart, no. They knew they lost the ruling. 
but they also knew something else. Since the 1970s, they had been playing this game. They take something from us, and they get taken to court, and all that happened to them, if they lose, was they had to give back what they took until the judges weren't looking again, at which point they take it again, and the whole game starts over. So this was the part of the game where they got caught doing something they shouldn't, they were putting it back with one change. Judge Moody's ruling. For the first time ever, if you really looked at his ruling close, it wasn't just you, Mark Morkin has until May 1st to turn in his petition signatures. In other words, it wasn't just you have to give Mark Moore back what you took. You got to give Mark Moore something else too. And that's the right to file in May. That's where it stands right now. If someone would challenge them on their law, they'd lose again. Most people, when they pass laws like this, don't have the resources, the time, or the inclination to fight them. There are a lot of laws in this country that may be unconstitutional and no one challenges us because they just don't feel like they can. New tonight, Democrat Joshua Mahoney has announced his plans to run for the U.S. Senate. If nominated, he would be running against incumbent Senator Tom Cotton, who announced his re-election campaign in August. In response to Mahoney entering the race, the Cotton campaign released the following statement, quote, Senator Cotton will be re-elected because of his record for delivering for Arkansas, including repealing the Obamacare mandate, helping secure funding for Arkansas infrastructure, and being a national leader in the fight against illegal drugs. What ended up happening is that we collected about 18,000 signatures within the 90 days. Uh, we took them into the Secretary of State's office and the Secretary of State accepted them, uh, but then asked the court, what do we do with these, basically? And so it was shortly after that the judge came out with her injunction, uh, which directed the Secretary of State to accept uh, 10,000 valid signatures as adequate. Uh, so that's really how we got onto the ballot. That's how we ended up in a situation where uh, Ricky Harrington was our candidate for U.S. Senate. Whenever I heard the news, it was July 3rd, uh, whenever Judge Baker issued the injunction, and I guess I just thought it so fitting. It just felt auspicious to me. My name is Dan Whitfield, and I'm running for the United States Senate as an independent in Arkansas against Tom Cotton. As an independent, I need 10,000 verified signatures. Fortunately, I have more than 400 volunteers around the state collecting signatures right now. I've been getting you know, anywhere from two to 300 signatures in my PO box every single day. So the support is just wonderful. So on November 4th, uh, we actually got up bright and early because we live up in Northwest Arkansas and we drove down to Little Rock. I believe we got there maybe around 10.30 or so, so I had a little bit of time to meet some people, shake some hands, and then I got in line, and I was actually the sixth person in line that day to file for my office. I was there before any of the other candidates. I, you know, the process was actually really streamlined and smooth since I showed up early. I didn't have a giant line to wait through, but it, it, it was awesome. At the time when I filed as an independent, I did know that there would be a few other candidates. I was lucky enough to be able to attend the Libertarian nomination convention just a few uh, days before that. So I got to meet Mr. Ricky Harrington, the Libertarian candidate. And I also knew that there would be a Democratic candidate. 
Now, what we didn't know at the time was the GOP actually had dirt on the Democratic candidate that they had gotten last May, and they sat on this dirt until one hour after the filing deadline. In breaking news, Democratic nominee Joshua Mahoney has announced his withdrawal from the U.S. Senate race via his Twitter account. And then they released a press release saying that they were suing for FEC fraudulent filings. So one hour after that, the Democratic candidate dropped out. So two hours after the filing deadline, there was no more Democrat in the race, and the Democratic Party would not be able to put another one in. So it was a, a really big surprise to everybody. We, no one saw this coming. Michael John Gray, the chairman of the Democratic Party of Arkansas, reported that the Democratic Party was not aware of Mahoney's intention to withdraw from the race prior to his Twitter announcement, nor were they notified by him directly following it. I understand if they had dirt on the candidate, they should have released it right away, but they took great pride in their strategy. And even after he dropped out, they put out another press release saying, this was our strategy, that's how I know, because they made it public information. And they gloated about it. But that's not how our democracy works. Our democracy is different. We should have a choice. And they took that choice away from the Democrats of Arkansas. So when they got uh, the Democrat to drop out of the race, they did know that I was still in it. Um, Tom Cotton's campaign had reached out to me about two years ago and opened up a dialogue and said, hey, when you're ready to debate, let us know. We got this. So I'm still waiting for that. I'm going to wait until after my signature uh, collection turn-in is done on May 1st before I debate him because I don't want them to think that I'm a strong candidate. I don't want to give them any reasons to throw out my petitions. I want them just to think, oh, this is just some you know, independent from Northwest Arkansas. We don't have to worry about him. But once I get that ballot access, that's when we're really going to hit it hard. That's when we're going to let them know that they made a big mistake. Independent Senate hopeful Dan Whitfield had hoped to run against Republican incumbent Tom Cotton and Libertarian Ricky Dale Harrington Jr. in November. He says that the social distancing guidelines regarding the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic hurt his chances to collect the 10,000 signatures needed by the May 1st deadline, and he was denied an extension by the state. Incumbent Tom Cotton and Libertarian Ricky Dale Harrington Jr. are the only names that you are going to see on the ballot in November for this U.S. Senate race. Senator Cotton's office, when reached out to for comment, instead released the following statement. Tom Cotton is working hard to win the votes of Arkansans for his reelection by confirming Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court, working to lower prescription drug costs, and protecting the unborn. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for the fourth and final program in Debate Week here on Arkansas PBS. At this hour, the campaign for the U.S. Senate. Appearing as the Libertarian Party candidate, Ricky Dale Harrington, Jr. This year, there is no Democratic Party nominee. The Republican incumbent, Senator Tom Cotton, chose not to participate. Following his opening statement, Mr. Harrington will be questioned by a panel of Arkansas journalists. And with that, Mr. Harrington, thank you for being with us. Your opening statement, sir, two minutes. Thank you for having me here. I just wanted to express my gratitude to Arkansas PBS for having this event. And I am humbled by your integrity of still having this even though my opponent, Senator Cotton, chose not to show up. And I also would like to thank him for giving me a great and wonderful birthday present so that I can speak directly to the people of Arkansas and make my case to be their representative in the United States Senate. And saying that, I just want to speak from my heart. It's not about me. It's about you. Right now in our country, we're in pain. I'm sure there are people right now in this very state 
that are opening up their light bill again and again. And that number continues to go up. You don't know how to pay for it right now. And you don't know how you're going to pay for it in the future. I want you to know that I feel your pain. And if you would please just indulge a preacher for just a moment, I'd like to share with you something that I learned from my college professor. He taught me conflict resolution. And he said, the gospel message is not about issues. It's about people. And I think that translates to what's going on right now in our country. We fight over issues, but the heart of the matter is that there are people on the other side of those issues that have those that they love. They want to see their children grow up. They want to make a life for themselves. So it doesn't matter your political affiliation. What matters is people. Ms. Farrell. There is now a greater focus on you. You are the last man standing, literally, because two other candidates wanted to unseat Tom Cotton, but they are not here. The latest polls show an 11 point spread between you and the senator. There are still some undecided voters out there. But that said, there are still people who have no idea who you are. And they don't realize that Senator Cotton has uh, an opponent in this race. So moving forward beyond this debate, how do you plan to get your message out there and let people know that you are a candidate for U.S. Senate? Well, I'm very appreciative for this moment right now because I have a chance to speak directly to Arkansans and let them know where I stand and what I hope to accomplish. Um, my schedule is, is filled. It's, <laughs> It's getting packed right now for events because people are, are learning now that there's another candidate after being told that Tom Cotton has been running unopposed. And right now, I, I guess it kind of looks like I'm running unopposed. Back to George Jarrett. Mr. Harrington, um, and could you please give us an honest answer about how you feel about your opponent choosing not to come here today and debate you, which is a, uh, a time-honored tradition in American politics? I'll tell you honestly, I was more afraid of you guys than I was afraid of Senator Cotton. Um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I was looking forward to looking him in the face and talking about the issues and having an intellectual debate on policy. And um, it's disheartening. And I understand the political move of it. Um, you, don't want to believe, you don't want to breathe life into your opponent's campaign. I'm a nobody. Nobody knows who I am. I'm a third party candidate and for him to show up here would breathe life into it. He's on Fox News, I don't know how many times a week, two, three times a week, but he can't come here to address the people of Arkansas. Why would you want to support someone who does that? Of course, uh, the, the ultimate outcome of that election was that our candidate for president did not receive 3% of the vote, so we go back to square one again. In that election there against Tom Cotton, um, President Biden, you know, outperformed us by just one percent, um, and he's the president of the United States now. But here in Arkansas, one of our top ticket candidates performed in such a manner, um, you know, giving the people the, the ability to vote for someone other than Senator Cotton, and you still consider the Libertarian Party not to be a political party? Why is it specifically tied to that? I just don't understand the logical reasoning by uh, keeping other parties off the ballot. And in essence, for me, uh, you know, ballot access laws are uh, voter suppression. When I first went into politics, I was making above six figures. I had a business that had a substantial value that I extracted out when I converted that business and went into politics. That amount of money that I put in the bank at that time sustained my family for the most part in addition to some debt over the next 14 years because I was virtually financially independent from the system. Now I've seen a lot of good people come into the system that were not in a position to be 
as financially independent as I, as I was, nor have as many means of alternate revenue as I could acquire, having been a plumber and being an engineer. At least keeping the family fed was a lot easier than it was for many others that I seen go into politics. And those that tried to stand for a while, that did not come in with at least some financial security, almost all of them either left very quickly or they compromised the system and became rich. And the politicians that survive, those politicians are generally the type that are rugged individualists that don't care what price they pay to not have a collar put on them. In other words, when the temptations come to them, they identify what is a collar to control them. Those type of individuals that survive that, they don't walk into the gray to compromise their principles and they pay the price. But the problem with that is, it's even the ones that stand. I mean, there's a line from Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, Jonathan Edwards says, that in due time, your foot shall slide. Now, one of the things that I thought about very often, almost every morning that I woke up when I was in elected office, is uh, a song by DC Talk. It was called, What If I Stumble, What If I Fall? Every day. That was on my mind. And that preserved me to some extent. But in due time, even your foot shall slide. Either a politician will slide or he will get out before he does. And the pressure on my personal life, on my family life, on my finances was enough that I did not want to stumble or fall. It was time for me to be gone. What can be said about these things? We all went into this with ideas of making the system fairer, better, and more just. And maybe we each had different ideas about what that meant. But it turns out, most of us had some of the same ideas about what that meant too. We were all sacrificing in some way for our ideals. In the course of this project, I found myself agreeing with people I never thought I'd agree with and liking people that the system tries to tell me are my political enemies. So in part, this is a cautionary tale. If you're doing it right, there's gonna be sacrifice. You're going to pay a cost whether you try to improve things from the inside or the outside. It's easy to give in to cynicism, to believe that things can never be different or better, that if those on the outside ever got access, well, the system would just corrupt them too. And the risk of that is real. But I have to believe there is a way that we can get better than what we have now. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Not just vigilance of the other team, but of your own team and of ourselves. Things are pretty bad now, but however bad they might be, I'm convinced they would be much worse without the kind of folks that you've met here. People fighting at a cost to keep the system way more honest than it wants to be.
Yeah.